Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, Brooklyn City Council member Rafael Espinal to talk about greening the city. And crime is down, but are we policing better? We'll find out. Hi and welcome to the show. I'm Ashley Ford. We've got a couple great guests today, so I want to jump right in. City Council member Rafael Espinal will be joining us to talk about nightlife and other things. And then a scholar and critic of police practice will talk about alternatives to policing. But first, these things. On Wednesday, a Brooklyn appeals court unanimously tossed out a conviction in the case of the 15-year-old murder of a college student. John Juca has been serving a life sentence for the murder, but the court determined that the Brooklyn DA's office had failed to turn over crucial evidence and never corrected the false or misleading testimony of a key witness. The case is notable because today, the office has a robust conviction review unit, though this, it seems, wasn't a case meriting their review. Or if it was, they drew a different conclusion than the judges. Heard of Haruda therapy? I hadn't, or I wish I hadn't, but apparently it's still a thing, after like 2,500 years. It's leech therapy. And a Brooklyn practitioner was just profiled on the cut. He treats conditions like migraines and dull skin with the slimy suckers out of a Greenpoint office called the Salesian Holistic Center. Holistic, as in holes in your skin? No, not pseudoscience, he says. And the blood is just incidental to the whole procedure. My blood's not incidental, so he's not getting it. Stay tuned for our talk with Council Member Espinal. <laughs> The 37th Council District in Brooklyn encompasses Bushwick, Brownsville, Cypress Hills, and East New York, perhaps the fastest changing part of the borough. Once a political backwater, now it's getting much attention as gentrification and development take hold. Overseeing the district is Rafael Espinal. We asked him to come on the show today to talk about his legislative priorities and his recent legislative victories, like overturning the outdated cabaret law. Thanks in part to his efforts, it's safe to dance, folks. Councilmember Espinal, welcome to 112BK. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to have you here. So many questions we have for you. <laughs> um, one of the things that you recently did a call in of an op-ed, and you talked about the public pressuring our politicians and our legislators to get us to a place where neighborhoods could run on 100% renewable energy. How would that even work? I mean, um... I guess when I'm when I'm talking about uh, our neighborhoods, I'm talking about the city as a whole, mm -hmm. right? Uh, making sure that your local city council member is uh, making that a priority of theirs when they're speaking to the mayor's office or when they're drafting legislation, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, I think it's important for all voters to know that mm -hmm. they actually have a say in what's going on in local politics. You know, right. you might feel that you have no control in what's happening in Washington, mm -hmm. but the person who's actually in charge of your everyday life, whether it be the garbage being picked up or mm -hmm. a pothole being filled, is your city council member, it's the mayor's office. Right. And I've seen colleagues of mine lose elections by two or three votes. Right. So your vote really matters in, in, in that regard. So mm -hmm. if you have an issue that's important to you, like climate change, uh, you should be putting the pressure on your local member to mm -hmm. start talking up on those issues as well. So, um, you know, I have legislation that's going to look at expanding uh, solar panels, mm -hmm. uh, green roofs, uh, wind turbine. You know, when, when those issues come up, it's important that my colleagues are in support of that legislation. Right. Because there's a lot of pressure um, coming from... Uh, special interests that mm -hmm. probably don't see it as a as a as a, a plan that works in their favor or in their bottom line when it comes to their right. profits. So you know it's important to have their support when legislation like that pops up. And I think that in the next few months, while I'm going to work on those issues, mm -hmm. uh, it's important that your council members get involved as well. Absolutely. So can you tell me with that specifically? And I agree with it to be mm -hmm. perfectly honest. But the pushback that I always hear on things that like making things greener anyway is it'll take too much time and people will lose jobs. That's what people seem to be worried about the most. But is that something that you're considering when you think about making a greener city? Yeah, I think in New York City, making a greener city actually is going to create jobs. 
right? We're going to have people employed who are going to be installing solar panels, installing wind turbine, uh, green roofs uh, is, is a model that hasn't been taken up in this country by any city. I'm hoping that New York City becomes the first city that man mandates every single rooftop mm -hmm. across the board is green. So that's going to create activity. We, we're not producing coal in the city. Right. <laughs> so this is a, a job creator, not a job breaker. Right. The thing I see on the street most of all, to be perfectly honest, is plastic bags. Mm -hmm. And I know that there was some discussion about that where you were concerned about people losing their jobs um, if we added like a tax or if we made people pay pay for plastic mm -hmm. bags, but have you reversed your position on that? Is that what I read? Yeah, um, this was an issue that came up about two years ago. It mm -hmm. was very um, hot and contested, and uh, it actually only passed the city council by two or three votes, so my mm -hmm. vote was one of those deciding votes. Right. Uh, but, you know, I had concerns. You know, there there are uh, bag, bag manufacturers in my district, there are bag distributors in my district, mm -hmm. and they were concerned that they would lose um, their business, and, they were, and right. people who work in those businesses would lose their jobs. But at the end of the day, I thought it was important that we look at the overall picture, and mm -hmm. it's that our globe uh, is under a lot of duress and a lot of stress, and mm -hmm. uh, if we don't take care of where we live, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you have a job or not. It if doesn't. you can't live here, it doesn't matter. It doesn't <laughs> so, matter at all. Right. So is that going to change? Is that something that you see changing anytime soon, the yeah. plastic bag rule? It passed the city council. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, um, the governor uh, didn't think it was a great idea. Mm. So he um, passed legislation or helped push legislation on right. a state level to block uh, the, the move we made. Mm -hmm. um, to, uh, I have to say the advocates aren't happy. Um, mm -hmm. We believe that the five cents uh, fee was the best way to reduce the use of plastic bags. Uh, so I think the conversation is going to continue moving forward. Right. Yeah. Well, when you talk about the importance of the average voter being heavily invested in their own local politics, or at least more invested in mm -hmm. their local politics, it has to be disheartening to be invested in something like the plastic bag fee and then have it pass, and then it goes to the governor and it doesn't happen. What do you do then as a voter? Like, where do you go? Do you start over, or do you start calling the governor's office? Yeah, you start, you start calling the governor's office. There's an yeah. election going on um, for the the governor's a seat this um, September and November. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you are passionate about plastic bags uh, being eradicated from our city, then this is your time to speak up. Um, right. And again, uh, the governor's decision did not move without their, your local senator or your local state assembly person voting on, mm -hmm. on his bill. So you also have to look at your state reps, right? right. There are state reps here in New York City who voted um, in favor of the governor's move. Right. So those are the people you should be speaking to as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's good to know. Um, let's talk about some more issues that are super important to your district, one of them obviously being development and gentrification. We recently had um, Borough President Eric Adams on to talk a little bit about it, and one of the things that he sort of you know, encouraged people to do was to not express too much concern about gentrification just because he said neighborhoods don't belong to any one ethnicity. We don't own our communities. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't, any ethnicity doesn't own a certain place in the city. But that doesn't take away from the fact that we want to live here, mm -hmm. right? We are people who've uh, built our lives here, have uh, had our families here. Um, our roots are tied uh, to Brooklyn as a whole, right? right? Um, and no one wants to leave. For the same pe reason people are moving in, mm -hmm. the same people don't want to leave Brooklyn. Right. So why not protect those individuals uh, by giving them uh, the same opportunities as those moving in have? And that's right. creating affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, the mayor outlined he had a, a plan to create 200,000 units over the next um, 10 years. Is actually actually is going to supersede that goal and push it to 300,000 units. Mm -hmm. It's something that I took on in East New York. Right. Uh, East New York was a neighborhood that we rezoned two years ago, and mm -hmm. the, the, the purpose of that rezoning was to create a comprehensive plan uh, to make sure that the residents who currently live there have all the tools and resources they need to right. stay there. Good paying job, mm -hmm. uh, access to affordable housing, tenant protection help. So I believe that those, those three prongs will give every person in my district the tools they need to stay in their neighborhood. So. That's wow. what we should be doing across the borough, mm -hmm. neighbor by neighborhood, find out what are the issues are. Uh, if, it's, if it's jobs, if it's uh, affordable housing, is it just protect, tenant mm -hmm. protection help? And make those investments in those communities. I think that everyone deserves the right to stay where they're from. I would hate to leave East New York. It's where I was born and raised, and I feel that a lot of people in Brooklyn feel the same way. Wow. Okay, so yesterday we spoke with your colleague, Richie Torres. 
and we asked him about the Progressive Caucus and the county organizations, that they're strong and influential in the Bronx and Queens, right? Kind of like kingmakers. Yeah. What's your take on those? Um, I mean, it's a complicated, thorny issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there are Democratic leaders in each borough who are in charge of the party. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are a, a Democrat and you're loyal to the Democratic platform, uh, naturally you're going to stick by with your Democratic colleagues and, mm -hmm. and the leader of the Democratic Party. Um, you know, there, there are many times where that is very helpful, especially when you're working on issues that are important to you, to have a band of people, of elected officials who are going to support you in that effort. When is it not helpful? Um, if if there's issues that you're you're not you're that you're not um, aligned with, right? Mm. You know, it's 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 hard. Um, it's it's hard to take a step where you know you're gonna upset not only the county leader but maybe 15 of your other colleagues. Um, mm -hmm. So. It's it's a thorny subject only because there are positives and negatives to it. Uh, right. But as a whole, uh, I, I see it as a model that, uh, for the most part, has, hel has helped a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, has has helped uh, shape um, the issues that members are working on for their borough as a whole. Um, you know, the Bronx has a great Democratic leader, mm -hmm. uh, Marcos Crespo, someone I worked with. He's young, he's Hispanic, uh, he cares about uh, the working and lower income class. Mm -hmm. And so you have good people who have these posts, and it's, it's, it's important to recognize that as well. Absolutely, yeah. it's important to recognize that. But what does it do to the Progressive Caucus, you know, that because they've lost some of their influence? All right, yeah, I mean, the Progressive Caucus, I think, is something that was born out of the Bloomberg era, mm. right? When people felt the government was more centric and more moderate. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we have a very a progressive mayor, de Blasio. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very progressive council. All the members are at least 90% of the members are progressives at heart. Right. Right. So this so at this point I feel like the Progressive Caucus mm -hmm. is just a label. Right. It's just a label mm -hmm. of like a, a, a band of, of folks who want to be part of this this group. Uh, but at the end of the day, their issues are everyone else's issues because right. we are a progressive city. Absolutely. Thank goodness. Okay, mm -hmm. I came from Indiana. I want to talk to you about the cabaret law, the office of nightlife, mm -hmm. and the nightmare. Right. Talk to me about these <laughs> things. Um, it's probably one of my personal uh, greatest achievements. Yes. Um, I, uh, aside from East New York, East New York is my home. Rezoning, great, big thing. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, as a, as a, as a social level, um, I thought it was important for government to finally recognize the importance of nightlife and mm -hmm. the, the role it plays on New Yorkers' lives. Um, right. On an individual level, I grew up in East New York. Mm -hmm. I had little access to entertainment. I had little access to anything outside of the social constructs that this investment has created for me and mm -hmm. my neighbors. Uh, and it wasn't until I got into my 20s I was able to branch out and go into Williamsburg, go into a bar, shoot darts, play pool, listen to music, go dancing, meet new people, mm -hmm. open myself to new ideas, and I think that that element of nightlife is not spoken about. You know, when right. you hear nightlife, or, or when, you, when people usually speak about nightlife, they think drinking, fights, yeah. gangs, you know, It's problems. always like, well, that's where the trouble is. Right, right. Yeah, Loud but music. nobody's <laughs> going out for trouble. <laughs> exactly. Like, nobody goes out at night looking for that kind of trouble. Right, right. I no. mean, there might maybe a select few who might put this to each other, right. don't like each other. Mm -hmm. That creates a big problem. But at the end of the day, nightlife is a part of our city's fabric, part mm -hmm. of its identity. Um, people move to the city, people mm -hmm. want to live in the city because of the access you have to your right. restaurants, your bars, and your dancing, and the dancing Oh yeah, scene. it's like when you think about where you want to live even, a mm -hmm. lot of it comes down to, you know, what can I do around there? Which brings me to the nightmare. Talk, like, what is a nightmare? Is he like Batman? Yeah. Or is he like, I mean, I guess he wouldn't necessarily be Batman. Like, Batman would be a terrible nightmare. He is right. truly such a downer. Yeah, he is a downer. But, like, the Joker could be a night. No, that would also no, go terrible. Kind of dangerous. But Very dangerous. somewhere in the between of the Joker and Batman. Yes. Uh, but their job <laughs> is to make sure that uh, venues are being represented that they're mm -hmm. not being heavily enforced upon, that their issues that they have with the city are being uh, taken care of, mm -hmm. but also working with the communities to figure out what are their issues with nightlife. Good. If there's a noise problem across the street, they'll talk to the bar, let them know that they have a noise problem before the cops come in and shut it down and make it make the, the business owner's life miserable. So this is balance. It's very balanced. Like, it's like somebody to have that conversation who's sort of almost a little bit of a neutral. Like, they want the nightlife to happen, but they also want it to work for the neighborhood it's in and for the people who live there. I love that yeah. idea. Question, who is the nightmare and can it be me? Um, it could have been you. 
Damn. Uh, but the application process actually closed. Damn. There will be an announcement in the next few weeks on who the nightmare will be. Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, so I'm excited to see who it is as well. Uh, they're holding that close to the vest, the mayor's offices. Uh, but I, I think there'll be someone who's going to be balanced, someone who understands nightlife as a whole and also understands Good. the importance of respecting communities. I'm looking forward to that announcement. It better be somebody cool. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having I me. I really appreciate it. Had Hopefully we'll fun. have you back soon. Yeah, thank you. He said that broken windows criminalizes the poor, that stop and frisk had to be stopped or at least slowed, that policing gang violence had little to do with actual gangs, and that cops were being inserted into too many facets of our public and private lives. Now he's calling for an end to policing. That's the title of his latest book released by Verso last year. And he joins us here on 112BK. Welcome, Professor Alex Vadley. Thank you. Can I ask you, so, so, so quickly, one of these things. Um, Mayor de Blasio just criticized Matt, Manhattan DA um, Cyrus Vance for saying that he would no longer prosecute turnstile jumpers. And he said that it would give the jumpers the idea that, you know, jumping the turnstile was okay. Can you talk about the broken windows philosophy behind that? Well, it's clear that the mayor <laughs> remains committed to the broken windows theory, which is really, it's a kind of analogy based on a hypothesis. It's never really been uh, scrutinized uh, with, with significant research, and the research that's been done is not very sympathetic to the theory for the most part. Anyway, it's the idea that if we allow people too much freedom in the public sphere to act in their own uh, choosing, that this will create conflicts over the standards of public behavior and the police right. will step in and try and need to step in and crack down on, on the diversities of public behaviors and that mm -hmm. this will somehow miraculously cause the homicide rate to drop. What actually happens? Well, what actually happens is a lot of criminalization of young people and those who are most marginalized in our society. One need only go to the criminal courts in any borough in this city and mm -hmm. see who is actually bearing the brunt of this. It's almost entirely people of color and a huge percent of them are homeless, have mental health and substance abuse issues, are very young, juveniles, and what I see is that this is about abandoning the city's responsibility to actually address the problems mm. that generate the disorder that we experience. And turnstile mm -hmm. jumping is a great example. At that fair, given the fact that we have this growing homeless population, a very large population that are under or unemployed, and the fares just keep going up, and mm -hmm. people cannot afford it. And so rather than dealing with the affordability issues with the subway, mm -hmm. coming up with reduced fares with people, let's say, who are eligible for food stamps or something like that, mm -hmm. making it free for young people, that they choose instead to criminalize people. Right. I mean, here's the thing that I know we're going to hear. These are the things that I think people are concerned about a little bit because they go, well, you know, there's just right and wrong. There's following the rules and then there's not following the rules. And when you don't follow the rules, you get in trouble. And when you do follow the rules, you don't get in trouble. And it seems like there's this very simplistic um, interpretation of how the law should work. Why doesn't it work that way? Well, this assumes that the rules have been agreed to broadly and serve the general interest in a kind of uncomplicated way. And mm -hmm. that's just not true. Right. There's a real misunderstanding about some of the legal frameworks that we've put in place that affect poor people disproportionately. Mm -hmm. There's an old saying from the 19th century that the law and its majesty prevents both the rich and the poor from sleeping under bridges mm. and begging for bread. But, of course, the rich don't need to do those things. Only the poor do. So that when we, you know, where is the moral responsibility of our elected officials mm -hmm. who have undercut the basic social safety net and made public transportation inaccessible to large segments of the public? 
I mean, that's a real question. I wish I had answers for you. I don't. But one of the things that keeps getting touted out by politicians this year is that crimes have reached a historic low in the city. Um, murder is way down. And it was James O'Neill's first full year as commissioner, but he hasn't disavowed broken windows, and he supports quality of life enforcement. Is that working? Like, if crime is down, or... So, yeah, quality of life enforcement, broken windows, a lot of what this new neighborhood police, it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's about using police to manage low-level disorder problems. Mm -hmm. And the, the NYPD is in a strong position to say that they are capable of driving drug dealers off a corner. Mm -hmm. And they are capable of evicting homeless people from a park. Mm -hmm. But that should not be confused with the dynamics of serious crime. Right. For instance, there are just as many homeless people before or after such an eviction, just as many drug dealers. Drugs are just as easy to get as they were before. Mm -hmm. One of the things we know about the crime drop is it is not a New York City phenomenon. Mm. It is an international phenomenon. And it can't possibly be solely because of something the NYPD did. Right. Now, they will make a claim that crime drop has been a little more dramatic here than some other places, and mm -hmm. that's true, but it's not more dramatic than every place. And a lot of places that have had very dramatic crime drops never heard of broken windows policing. Mm -hmm. Certainly weren't doing it. Right. San Diego is an example. So uh, maybe some part of the extra crime drop in New York had something to do with what the police were doing, but that can't possibly be the overall explanation. Right. So one of the things that I keep thinking about with this is the distinction between misdemeanors and felonies. Because while I think felonies have dropped significantly, misdemeanors are about the same, or have they dropped as no, well? No, misdemeanors have dropped as well. That was a concern we had, many of us, was that the NYPD was only reporting felony data for mm. many years, and mm -hmm. we were like, well, are they just misclassifying things down to misdemeanors? Right. So with a lot of public pressure, they began also reporting out uh, misdemeanor larcenies, misdemeanor sexual assaults, mm. and some other categories so mm -hmm. that we could see that. And what we've seen is that those categories are also dropping. Mm -hmm. Now, what this doesn't take into account is discretionary enforcement of things like the war on drugs and, and the public sex work and things. That's right. more driven by political priorities. So marijuana arrests exploded under the uh, Bloomberg administration, not mm -hmm. because more people were smoking marijuana, but because right. the broken windows theory and the political right. prioritizing of that. Right. They've come down off those highs, but not nearly as much as we were led to believe they might. And this, I think, remains a, a big problem. But, you know, there are these people who are pretty anti-reform and really believe that everything that the NYPD, do, the NYPD is doing right now is exactly what the NYPD should be doing right now. Um, and those people would tell us that, you know, well, the police are just in those neighborhoods more because there's more crime in those neighborhoods. Is that true? Do they have a point? Or is that a general misunderstanding? So there are a couple of things. For, for In terms of serious crime, there is some truth to that, mm -hmm. especially violent crime. It's pretty heavily concentrated in some identifiable places, and, and mm -hmm. our public housing developments, unfortunately, are, are a locus of a lot of that. And that is why the police claim they just go where the crime is. Now, on other things, this just isn't true, mm. like marijuana enforcement rates. Right. They'll say, well, it's about complaints, but even that's not true. If we look at the 311 data, that just doesn't play out. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, it makes a set of assumptions similar to the ones about sleeping under the bridge, which is that somehow all neighborhoods ha begin at the same starting point. Mm. But there's a reason why certain neighborhoods have greater challenges than others. And when a very poor neighborhood that suffered from historic segregation, unemployment, discrimination in housing and employment services, inadequate government services, when they have a crime or disorder problem, they get aggressive, invasive, and heavy-handed policing. Mm -hmm. But when a wealthy white community has a problem, they get social services, better mm -hmm. after-school programs. So it's even if we understand that the crime is heavily concentrated in certain places, why do those mm. places only get coercive, 
state services and never state services that build people up, that build communities. Why do they? Well, this is a main theme within the book, is that we are caught in this neoliberal ideology mm -hmm. that says that positive government resources need to be pushed up the economic ladder mm. to boost the people who are already successful in hopes that their mm. increased success will somehow miraculously trickle down to the rest of us. Right. Well, I've been in a public employee for 20 years. I've yet to see any trickle down from any right. of that. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting. Mm -hmm. But Aren't we all? And it also means that the problems of the poor have to be understood as problems of individual and group moral failure. Mm -hmm. Because the alternative would be to understand that they're the result of market failures. Right. The distorting of the housing market, the polarization of the labor market and wages and the cutting out of the social safety net. And so for proponents of this kind of neoliberal restructuring, we sometimes call it, they have got to label everything as individual and group moral failing. Otherwise, mm. the state would have an obligation not to continue to subsidize their wealth. Wow. And they don't Ooh. want to do that. This is super interesting. I hope all of this is in your book. And speaking yes. of your book, um, it's called The End of Policing. And there are a lot of people who consider themselves abolitionists who actually want to see the end of police, like, at, period. Mm -hmm. Is that where you are? Or are you thinking of more of like a reimagining of the role of police in communities? Well, the title has a kind of double meaning. There's a kind of means and ends meaning mm -hmm. to it. It's like, well, what is the ultimate purpose of police? Mm -hmm. And why is it that we've come to see the police as the tool to solve so many social problems, mm -hmm. a lot of which just weren't part of their remit 30, 40, 50 years ago? Right. But also it's about imagining how we can solve problems without relying on police. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't talk about ending all police or imagine a world without police. It's very concrete. It takes very specific community problems like mm -hmm. what's going on in schools or how we're dealing with drugs or what's going on with youth violence. And it looks at the ways in which policing actually is part of the problem right. and how there really are concrete alternatives that don't rely on handguns and ticket books and arrests mm -hmm. to solve our community problems. Excellent. So pick up the book in order to get a more holistic idea of what life could look like. We get a little bit more involved and ask a little bit more of our police, I think. is what And our said. politicians. And our politicians. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. And now the second installment of our weekly weekend update, where we give you a lightly curated review of some city happenings to check out. I say light because we only have time for one. Did you know that February 9th is National Bagel and Lox Day? Come on. I mean, is every day of the year some kind of day? Like, is there a liverwurst on rye day? Maybe in March? Or linguine and clams day? But for real, Lox and Bagel Day. And there's this smoked fish wholesaler in Greenpoint that opens up its store every Friday to the general public. And those in the know line up for sable and whitefish salad. Yuck. But this Friday, they're going even bigger, trying to break the record for biggest bagel and lox sandwich ever. So go have a bite at 30 Gym Street. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great weekend. Next week, we'll be back with another city council member, Robert Cornegie school cafeteria health violations, a new local journalism endeavor, Lunar New Year, and some VR. Hope to see you then.